Welcome to the Franciscan School of Theology. I'm um, Garrett Galvin. I'm the interim dean this year. And it's my pleasure to introduce Brother John Kiesler, who will be our speaker this evening. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Brother John. And he did his dissertation at Nijmegen, the Catholic University of Holland. And the title of it was Signs and Instruments of Liberation, the Confederation of Latin American Religious and the Contextual Theology of Religious Life from 1966 until 1991. And one of the central findings he had in that was the necessity of consecrated life and evangelization working together. And um, so he's been thinking about evangelization for a long time. He's been teaching at our school now nearly for 20 years. And he also does a lot of work with lay missionaries and doctor missionaries um, up in Los Angeles, and he's been doing that um, for well over a decade now. And so Brother John has been to Brazil to do a lot of the research that he wrote his dissertation on, and has taught widely um, our, many of our introductory courses, and as well as the courses that he specializes in, in terms of religious life and missiology. And when I was a brand new Franciscan, and we, I would always hear about Brother John studying away over in Holland. And the friars sent me off to Germany one summer to learn some German. And, um, and I think Brother John had read that Garrett was going over <laughs> to Germany. And there are two Garretts in our province. That's right. One with one T and one like myself with two Ts. So I got a very nice note from Brother John. Please stop by on, on your way there. And I think he thought it was the other Garrett. I showed up, and I was a little bit different than the other Garrett, but, um, but John was very warm and welcoming the whole time I was there. I got a great kind of master's class on Dutch art. We covered um, the whole country looking at different museums, and um, it was just a wonderful way to meet John, and he's a wonderful colleague to have here, and I know you'll enjoy this talk this evening. Thank you, Garrett, for your kind words. You know, I'm, I'm really not an expert in anything. I'm just someone who's curious. So I thank you for coming tonight. Um, let's begin. I'm going to begin with a couple scripture readings and then a reading that's going to seem a bit odd, and that's okay, at least to me, <laughs> and hopefully to you later. First reading is from the first letter of Peter. Simply proclaim the Lord Christ holy in your hearts and always have your answer ready for people who ask you the reason for the hope that you have, but give it with courtesy and respect and a clear conscience so that those who slander your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed by their accusations. First Peter, from the Acts of the Apostles. They got him, St. Paul, to accompany them to the Areopagus, where they said to him, Can we know what this new doctrine is that you're teaching? Some of the things you say seem startling to us, and we would like to find out what they mean. The one amusement the Athenians and foreigners living there seem to have is to discuss and listen to all the latest ideas. So Paul stood before them, the whole council of Areopagus and made this speech, men of Athens. I have seen for myself how extremely scrupulous you are in religious matters. Because as I extolled looking around at your sacred monuments, I noticed among other things an altar inscribed to the unknown God. In fact, the unknown God you revere is the one I proclaim. Since the God who made heaven and earth and everything in it in himself, the Lord of heaven and earth, he does not make his home in shrines made of human hands, nor is he in need of anything that he should be served by human hands. On the contrary, it is he who gives everything, including life and breath. For one single principle, he not only created the whole human race so that they could occupy the earth, but decreed times and limits of their habitations. And he did this so that he might seek the day, so that they might seek the deity, and by feeling their way towards him, succeed in finding him, and indeed 
he is not far from any of us. Since it is in him that we live and move and exist and have our being, we are all his children. We are the children of God. We have no excuse for thinking that the deity looks like gold or silver or stone carved and designed by people. But now overlooking the times of ignorance, God is telling everyone everywhere they must repent. Because he is fixed on a day, the whole world will be judged and the upright will be rewarded. And God has publicly proved this by raising Jesus from the dead. At the mention of rising from the dead, the Athen- some of the Athenians burst out laughing. Others said, we would like to hear you talk about this at another time. And now the odd reading. At last the, oops, let me get my little digger here for heaven's sakes. Oop, there we go. At last the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and addressed Alice in a languid and sleepy voice. Who are you? said the caterpillar. Alice replied rather shyly, I I hardly know myself just at present. At least I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have changed several times since then. What do you mean by that? The caterpillar said sternly. Explain yourself. I can't explain myself, I'm afraid, sir, said Alice, because I'm not myself. You see, being so many different sizes and shapes in a day is very confusing. She drew herself up and said very gravely, I think you ought to tell me who you are first. Why, said the caterpillar. As Alice could not think of any good reason, the caterpillar seemed to be in a very unpleasant state of mind. She turned away. Come back, said the caterpillar. I have something important to say. Alice turned around. Keep your temper, said the caterpillar. Is that all, said Alice? No, said the caterpillar. You're probably wondering at this point why someone would begin a talk on the new evangelization with two readings from scripture and of course a selection from Alice in Wonderland. I think the questions that Alice was posed by the caterpillar are questions that we all have to answer in any kind of relationship with the world, any kind of outward focus for evangelization. Who are you? Explain yourself. Tell us who you are and why we should listen to you. In this brief time, I would like to explore the topic of evangelization. How was central to early Franciscans? I'll call this a centrifugal dimension of Franciscan life, moving outward. I'll talk about this in relation to a brief snapshot of the tradition of Franciscans, very brief vignettes of of Francis and certain other friars. Then look a bit at the world today to show that how different it is from Francis's time and we ought not think that they are comparable. We'll look a little bit at terminology. Not a topic that's very fun, I know, but words like mission and evangelization are a veritable morass, a swampland in which meanings can vary And there is a fog in terms of what we understand and portray to others. Luckily, we'll have some help from a couple document, magisterial documents to help us. And then we'll look a little bit at new evangelization and the apostolic exhortation as a document not to give us answers. Because as we know, as those of you who were in the intro to theology class know, magisterial documents don't give us answers. They don't, they're not how-to manuals. They're not documents that we can look at like we look at an instruction manual for fixing our VCR or our television. Maybe I just dated myself on VCR. (laughs) I'm not sure. But we'll look at, but what they, what magisterial documents do do, and what I hope that a brief review of 
Evangelii Gaudium will do is raise questions. Offer us a new perspective in what? How we go about understanding our identity in church, how we go about seeing our role in the world, and how we go about thinking in terms of structures and institutions of the church. That's quite a bit. So let's get started. Francis. The focus of Francis and the early friars was certainly living and preaching the gospel, to give example to people, to foster renewal. And from the early legenda, which I won't go through because I'm not an expert, but we've all, most of us have been familiar with, we see that Francis and his companions were traveling quite a bit on the road, going here and there, preaching, teaching, giving good examples, sometimes examples that to us seem a bit silly, but examples of imitating Christ by being on the road. His small bands eventually, as we know, spread out from, out, from Assisi throughout Europe, again, preaching penance, love of the poor, and the love of God. But in those stories, a couple things are easy to forget. One, that Francis did not mold his community of friars after existing models of religious life, and this is extremely important. He, he chose to become neither a canon regular, rooted in a, a city next to a cathedral, nor did he want to accept the Benedictine rule with a vow of stability, nor did he want an order of hermits. He wanted a new group of clerics and laics to preach penance and the love of God without the limits of monasticism. And he claimed to see his group, as he says in the Testament, that God told him what to do, as very much from the inspiration that he felt by God. The result was, in Francis's day, the questions, who are you and explain yourself, were front and center. And they had to be. Because in the Middle Ages, Christendom was at its height, and groups wandering around with distinctive clothing and preaching outside of churches had to have some sort of justification or legi legitimation, or they might very well find themselves in trouble from ecclesial or civil authorities. For who are we? Francis saw in him and his brotherhood as minors, poor people, aligned following the poor Christ in humility, poverty, and joy but aware of God's great love and unafraid to preach that through word and example. But he also saw his brotherhood as Roman Catholic. He very early sought approval from the Pope. And while initially it was misunderstood, approval was granted to preach, to go out. But this movement was not only for Assisi. As a mirror of perfection tells us, uh, uh, one of the stories that was quite a bit later, I think 1318 maybe is when they dated, there's a, a discussion by Cardinal Hugolino in Francis. The Cardinal wanted to know why Francis was always wanting to go out and about. Why not just stay in Assisi and do your good things here? Rebuild churches, preach, teach, edify, and this is what happened. The Lord Bishop, however, said to Francis, as if rebuking him, why did you send your brothers so far away to die of hunger and so many other trials? In great fervor, in the spirit of prophecy, blessed Francis answered him, Lord, do not think that the Lord sent the brothers only to these regions. But I tell you in truth, the Lord chose and sent brothers for the benefits and salvation of the souls of all the peoples in this world. They should be received not only for the land of believers, but also for non-believers. And they will win over many souls. And this happened with the early Franciscan communities. We see in 
this outward push to go, to travel, to move, to send friars. And sometimes with, with, uh, with events that we hear that are a little bit funny, but, but, but not probably at the time as early friars went to Germany, knew no German. They were asked in German, so the story says, are you a heretic? And the friar, having heard the word ja, yeah, said ja, yeah, and the result was they were kicked out of town and probably a good motivation to learn languages, you know? <laughs> but the movement out of Assisi in itself was not unique. There were wandering preaching groups before Francis, we know that, but he chose to remain loyal to the church and did not restrict the movements of the brothers to Christendom. For it was as the, the famous dialogue between Lady Poverty and the brothers in the Sacrum Commercium says, the world is our cloister. Friars were very early on sent to Syria and Morocco to preach and to witness. Let's see if that works. Hey, look at that. I want to take just a minute and talk about Francis's encounter with the Sultan, um, which is a famous story and one which people would, may tend to say, ah, that's probably just a legend, you know, a, a great fairy tale. But at least from sources I've read, it's almost certain that it actually happened because there are at least two or three accounts of this event that are from the time. Jacques de Vitry and another person that was probably one of the knights involved writing much later. The, the time was 1219 and after two um, previous attempts to go to Muslim countries, Francis hitches a ride on a boat to Damietta, which was in northern, Italy, northern, northern Egypt, the uh, mouth of the Nile, and it was the site of an encampment of crusaders for the Fifth Crusade, which was trying to cut off the Muslims from northern Europe and force their evacuation from the Holy Land. It was the only crusade that was actually directed by a papal delegate not by rulers, but by a papal delegate. Francis went and apparently arrived a couple days after there was a rather brutal battle. He went to the camp and was convinced that the only way that there could be peace is if he preaches and converts the head of the Muslim army, the Sultan. So being a clever fellow, he knows that he can't just leave the camp with his companions and then come back because people might think you're being, you're a spy. So after three attempts of asking the cardinal in charge of the army for permission, the cardinal finally says, okay, you take a couple of your brothers and go over there, thinking that Francis would probably be martyred quite quickly. Francis crosses the battle lines, um, is captured by Muslim sentries, uh, beaten up apparently a little bit, and taken to the Sultan. Um, which, you know, a nice little rendition here. Um, and the Sultan instantly uh, thinks that, this, that these men, and there are apparently one or two friars that went with Francis, we're not sure. Um, so the Sultan has Francis and at least one or two other friars. And the Sultan is initially thinking either these bedraggled, scruffy men are emissaries from the Crusaders, you know, to negotiate some new peace or some new deal for a truce, or that they're vagabond monks who want to become Muslim, which did happen. So who are you? The question was posed to Francis, and his answer in a style that was typically Francis of Assisi, I am an emissary of the great king, sent here because I am concerned about your soul. The sultan was so touched by this answer, and who wouldn't be, you know, I'm concerned about your soul, I mean, God, that he 
engaged in a process of discussion and dialogue with the man, apparently over the objection of his mullahs, and eventually let Francis go on his way back. The mission was in some ways a, a failure for Francis. He was neither martyred, which he was hoping for, nor did the Sultan ever convert. However, we see in the Regula Non Bellata from 1219 evidence of this visit. In chapter 16, there is the first mention in a religious rule of mission of evangelization. This will be altered a little bit in the approved rule of 1223, but there will still be a chapter dealing with mission among those who are not Christian. In the rule, in, but regular Nambalata 16 states, as for brothers who go, who go out, they can live spiritually among the Saracens and non-believers in two ways. One way is not to engage in arguments or disputes, but to be subject to every human creature for God's sake and to acknowledge that they are Christians. The other way is to announce the word of God when they see that it pleases the Lord in order that they may believe in Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Creator of all, the Son, the Redeemer, the Savior, and be baptized and become Christians because no one can enter the kingdom of God without being reborn of the Holy Spirit. Two ways of going among the Saracens. What makes it so unique prior to this, there was generally one way to go among the Saracens if you were you know, a single mi a missionary, and that was to go into the town square, denounce Muhammad, denounce the Quran, and in short order, be martyred. This sort of desire to go out, this push, will continue in later Franciscans, even as you know, within 50, 60 years of the death of Francis, the friars themselves will mostly be established in large communities, or at least in large urban areas in Europe, so that mendicancy wandering about will generally be restricted, and for very good reasons. You know, who's going to feed all these people? Who's going to care for them? Um, but there was, but this outward kind of push continued. A couple examples, in 1245, Pope Innocent IV sent two separate missions to the Mongols. The Mongols were like the Crips of today. They were always the people you fear and are afraid of. And it was really just a fluke of history in 1241 that Europe wasn't completely destroyed by the Mongols. There was a major battle in Hungary where the Mongols absolutely destroyed the army of the emperor. All of Europe was open to them. And what happened? The leader of the army got a message. The, the leader, uh, leader in Mongolia, the great Khan, had died. So he turned his army around and went back to Mongolia to take care of business. In 1245, a couple years after this event, uh, Pope Innocent sent two, uh, two missions to try to convert the Mongols because, you know, if you want to be friends with them. These people are no one to mess with. One was a group composed of three Dominicans and a friar that eventually made it to the, uh, to, uh, through what's now Iran into the Khan, area of the Khan. A second was from John of Pian de Carpino. He went with a, uh, a Franciscan with a Polish brother, delivering a letter to the Khan saying, you know, we're really upset that you tried to invade Europe, and why don't you think about becoming Christian? Um, so it was a matter of walking from Italy all the way across to Mongolia. 3,000 miles. It took him the better part of a year 
And when he went there, the Khan read his letter, the Khan, of course, being the head of the Mongols. He was not amused. He said, um, in fact, I'm not going to convert, but I want to send you a letter back telling the Pope he better start sending me tribute, money. And by the way, I want you to leave now, even though it's the middle of winter. Uh, somehow or another, John and his companion made it all the way back to Italy in the middle of crossing, crossing Russia in the middle of the winter. Amazing. John of Monte Corvino in 1289 was sent by Nicholas IV to preach to Asia, went through Persia, Mongolia, and China, tried again to convert the Mongolians. It didn't work. But he eventually stayed in Peking, became the first real archbishop there of Peking, at least in the 14th century for the Latin church. The Nestorians had a bishop there 600 years before, but we won't talk about that. He learned some of the languages and was, apt, and was actually able to translate um, the Bible into Uyghur for the people. Odoric of Poderone, a brother who apparently wandered for 13 years through the Balkans, Russia, Persia, Mongolia, Indonesia, Indochina, and China. Uh, maybe without permission of anybody, we're not quite sure. But he eventually made it back to Italy and had a nice little journal. Um, Ramon Lull, I could spend all night on Ramon Lull. I like Ramon Lull. He's sort of the, the mad hatter of the Franciscan tradition. <laughs> and maybe that's why I like him. He was born as an aristocrat's son, grew up in Mallorca, had a rather jarring conversion experience, decided that it was his mission to reach out to Muslims and Jews in the Iberian Peninsula. He went to the University of Paris for a few years to learn Hebrew, to learn enough Latin, uh, became a third order Franciscan member, at least tradition tells us. There's nothing extant proving that apparently. Um, but what is amazing about Ramon, at least to me, is that when he returned back to his native Spain, he undertook a, a, a serious study of Hebrew and Arabic, and also Kabbalah, and also the logicians of the era of the Muslim world, some of their great logicians. He developed a method of trying to preach to peoples based not on scripture, but on looking at virtues. Because he said it's useless to begin with scripture talking to Muslims or Jews. His method really did sort of mimic Kabbalah, but it also is very insightful. He, his texts are in Arabic, Latin, Catalan. He has over 265 works that are extant today. And in many forms, some are dialogues. He has a novel, stories, ap apologetic works. Um, he pressured the Pope into establishing language schools because again for him, who are you and explain yourself meant trying to make yourself understandable, not only in the first language of the other people, but trying to use the logic and the forms that the Muslims and Jews had to make what he was saying comprehensible. He died in 1315 after being martyr. Now there's many other missionaries and people I could of course mention. The great push to the Americas in the 16th century, one of which is affects we're sitting in right now, Mission San Luis Rey. It's only a partial list, but it shows that this centrifugal uh, force in Franciscanism is not dead, was not dead, but that it still caused people to answer two separate questions. Who are you? and explain yourself. And for Franciscans, the explanations were never about us alone. They were relational, pointing to church and pointing to God. 
trying to bring people to see the God we're talking about and the Christ we're talking about and hopefully transforming societies. How am I doing? Ooh. Oh. Oh. <laughs> we're not in the 13th century. There were no motorized cupcakes in Francis's day. Um, and it may seem a bit redundant to say we're not in the 13th century, but I, I think it bears some reflection because all too often the tendency is, I think, to say, well, basic human longings are the same as in the past. We all want to love, we all want community, we want transcendence, we want family, we want self-worth, and that's very true. That's part of who we are as humans. However, these human longings are always given shape and form by human structures and cultures that can either encourage human development and transcendence or ignore them. We're not in the world of Francis. The world that we have today is asking us to explain who we are and to explain ourselves, and it's a world that is far different. A world, ooh, sorry, a world not in the sense of the Gospel of John that's filled with evil and terrible things that resist God, but a world of human structures, of nature, that is being shaped by forces that are far different, that are asking us for explanation and who are you? I'm going to blast through a few of these. Um, I don't want to keep you too long. Secularization. We've heard of secularization, and, uh, and usually it's described in church documents almost like it's a virus, you know, that we have to watch out for. Um, it's a reality that the structures and systems we have today whether political, cultural, economic, are totally focused on human relationships without any concept or relationship to anything that is transcendent. The questions about God, questions about ultimacy, are not things that normally come up or are considered. Um, we've seen through public opinion surveys that religiosity and religious belonging is starting to dip a bit, especially with younger peoples. Now, any of you that know anything about opinion surveys know that they can be very unreliable. And they are doubly unreliable when we ask questions about religion or religious belongings for two very good reasons. One, what does that mean? If you're saying, do you go to church every Sunday? Great, but maybe it's go to church because you like the music and you don't care about anything else. So what does it mean? And two, um, people tend to, shall I say, exaggerate their participation and their commitments. So studies, and again, I won't spend too much time on them, like the Pew study of 2010, the Pew Foundation, Religion Among the Millennials, found that 26%, this is a group 18 to 29 years old, said they had no church or religious affiliation. And what does that compare with boomers, those of us in our 50s and 60s? At the same time in our life, that number was about... 13%. The same with identification of church, the same with belief in God. A dip of at least 10% over the last generation in terms of belief in God, affiliation with religion, self-reported. There's also uh, drop-offs uh, among certain groups, Hispanics approximately 25% have left Catholicism uh, by a, a survey by Pew in 2014. Now, why is that? P 
people argue, is it, a, is it a result of the same forces that were driving the exodus of Catholics in Latin America over the last 40 years, which has been rather stunning? Is it a result of, in the United States, adaptation? Is it a result of the pastoral structure here? It, we don't know. But the result is that there is some real changes underfoot that we may not see right now, but younger people, 18 to 29 years old, are becoming far less concerned about issues around God and certainly around issues of um, church belonging. Pluralism. You know, in Francis's day, there were certainly heretical groups. There were certainly groups that thought other than Christianity, but those groups were not tolerated, you know? Today, we live in a world that is radically plural. Francis had to travel across an ocean to meet a Muslim. People today can click on an internet and find out about Islam. Uh, we live in a time that anthropologists have said has had the greatest human migration in the last 50 years in all continents, in all directions, bringing us close to, uh, uh, close to peoples of different cultural, racial, and ethnic differences Differences that in Francis' day, again, were not so close and sometimes not so accentuated. Um, the rise of the modern state. Francis' day, most of, the, most of the states were small city-states or kingdoms. Today, we're in the situation of modern states, where education and social welfare has largely been taken over by the state and increasingly centralized and homogenized and we've seen the 20th century as a period of time where education has been used for vehicles of ideology that can marginalize or in many cases attack religious belief. Science and technology, one that we certainly know. Francis's day, there was certainly science, there was certainly technology. You think of ag improvements in agriculture, think of uh, stirrups for horse for uh, riders on horses for heaven's sakes think of uh, technologies that allow ships to go further from shore but in Francis's day there was still seen to be a connection between the world around us and the heavens there was still seen to be a connection between spirits and God working in nature and around us that belief no longer exists. Modern technology has, in some sense, helped us to strip the world of myths that we had in the past. That while God's presence may be with us and active, and I believe it is, we certainly can't point to rain, earthquakes, or floods as being proof positive of that. We've also seen technologies and science that not only explore the world, but are in some ways very radically modifying nature and the human being itself. Think of genetically modified crops, uh, 3D printers that are even making spare body parts. Think of electronic currencies that have no connection to nation states or central banks. Think of robots, artificial intelligence and military weapons that can disrupt a person's DNA without them knowing it. We're living at a time where there can be a massive impetus to reduce suffering, to provide goods to people, or on the other side, a time that could lead to some Orwellian dystopia. Mass media Francis was surrounded by nature or surrounded by media. The average American spends maybe four hours a day on the television. The constant buzz of cell phones, of television, of movies, it's not that we're, it's linked to consumerism and a consumer culture. It's not that we're, uh, you know, microbes or cells that somehow absorb everything we're told. That's not the point. 
but it certainly affects how we perceive and understand just by sheer force of repetition. Globalization, again, another word I, that I could, could spend a lot of time on, I'm not going to. It points to a new sense of connectedness in this world brought about by the internet, brought about by trade agreements, brought about really by a new sense that we're all one on this planet. And with that, a new recognition of inequalities between the rich and the poor and relationships that we have with people we've never met through decisions we make in daily life. Whether buying products, selling products, using products, and that national policies have effects that can be crippling to other countries. Globalization on the one hand homogenizes, but on the other hand it motivates groups of peoples to focus on their uniqueness. The whole push about culture and, and ethnic identities is in many ways, according to Castes from uh, Berkeley, a direct result of the fear of globalization. People do not want to be uniform size, shape, and culture. This is just a brief sketch. And again, I, I just say that of, of the world that we're in, it's secular, it's pluralistic, it's mostly urban in large modern states affected by science and technology, globalized swimming in electronic images from modern media. This is neither good nor bad. It just is. But to pretend otherwise is to live in a different world because this is the world that's asking Franciscans and the church, who are you and explain yourself and we have to be aware of that and the presumptions and the worldview that people have. Otherwise, we may be speaking very eloquently to a people that do not exist. I want to spend just a couple minutes. Again, I don't want to bore you or take too much time. You've noticed up to this point, I've avoided the term evangelization and mission with a passion. I've spoken of centrifugal dimensions. The reason for that is that the terms evangelization and mission are a literal swampland, even among theologians, with different meanings, different nuances, different opinions. Um, and in fact, one of the uh, a famous theologians, David Barrett, and can, can you imagine, he went through theological journals for the last 60 years in various languages to find out how the term evangelization, which is more a Catholic term, or evangelism, which is sort of the Protestant, to see how they were used and what meanings. Uh, he came up with 300 different definitions and over 700 synonyms. I admire his patience. So, so what, what does this help? How does this help us? Well, I think it helps us to recognize that we have to be at least a little clear what we're talking about. And again, for brevity, I'll just mention a couple documents. First, Vatican II mentioned that, in Agent, is mentioned that mission is not an add-on for the church. It's part of who we are. It's part of church, going outside of ourselves to talk about Christ because of the Trinity, and that laity have an important role, working in secular areas of life to bring gospel values, to bring values of truth and justice to economic, social, political, cultural, to raise them up a second document, do I have it up? I do. Evangelii Nunciandi, 1974 document by Paul VI, probably gives us the clearest definition of uh, evangelization from a Catholic point of view. For the church, evangelizing means bringing the good news to all strata of humanity and through its influence, transforming humanity from within. For the church, evangelizing means bringing the gospel. Okay, I just said that. Uh, and what does that mean in terms of um, 
the strata. It means for the church, it is a question not only of preaching the gospel to an ever wider geographical area or ever greater numbers, but affecting and as it were upsetting through the power of the gospel, humanity's criteria of judgment, determining values, sources of inspiration, lines of thought, points of view, and models of life. Evangelization, to make it short, is not just a matter of getting new members. Every club wants new members. It's a matter of having the values from Christ, first of all, be lived by the church, but suffused to society so that economic, social, political, the way we think, what we admire is Christian. And to put it in cruder terms, it makes there's something seriously wrong if your church is getting lots of members and your popular culture is filled with trash and hedonism. There's something out of whack nationally. So evangelization is about the transformation of life, an ongoing process, a dialogue that's not just external, but internal. Okay, here we go. What is the new evangelization? See, I'm finally getting there. Be pa you guys have been patient. It doesn't get much easier though, I'm sorry. You know, the first modern use of this term, new evangelization, it appeared as a phrase in the Puebla document in 1979, but it was just mentioned, new evangelization, okay? And it wasn't until 1983 at a meeting also of Latin American bishops in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, that John Paul II called for a new evangelization in ardor, methods, and expressions and that the focus of this new evangelization would be the secularized West. This led to a flurry of discussion as to what this really meant. And theologians were trying to distinguish between new evangelization and re-evangelization. And one term is used for Europe and the other is used for other countries because Europe, you know, is somehow still Christian. Um, and it also led to questions, you know, uh, like what does new mean? Uh, especially when it's posed in a time of modernity like we're in, where every product, every consumer product justifies itself by its novelty. You know, new and improved tide, new and improved this. New, uh, is that what we mean? Is it just a branding strategy? And the deeper questions, why bring people into the church in terms of pluralism and how to deal with the internecine fights within it? Pope Benedict in 2010 uh, called a synod of bishops. Now, a synod of bishops is, of course, a gathering like we just had that usually deals with topics. It's not the same as a council, nor does it have the same doctrinal or, or importance. But it is important because it brings bishops together to focus on certain themes. And Pope Benedict wanted a synod to gather in 2012 to deal with the new evangelization. 262 bishops were invited, which was up to that point the largest number, along with 45 experts and 45 auditors composed of men and women who were seen as experts in evangelization, plus 15 representatives from different other religions. Uh, Dr. Rowan Williams from Canterbury, uh, Patriarch Bartholomew I from Constantinople, Brother Aldous from the Taizé community, and even a representative from the American ba uh, Bible Society. At the end of the synod, propositions were voted on and sent to the Pope, where traditionally he would write an apostolic exhortation summarizing everything. From what we know of the initial documents and the propositions that had been gleaned, the concern was around issues that we just talked about, secularization, youth catechesis, 
uh, threats to the church, but it was very much a concern of almost circle up the wagons. We're in dangerous times. We have to reassort who we are and what we need to do. What happens is that on March 13th, 2013, Pope Francis is elected, and he's given the task of drawing up this apostolic uh, exhortation to summarize the Synod. It, and this was the, is the document that you've been waiting for me probably to talk about, Evangelia Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, that was issued almost a year ago, November 24th, 2013. Um, now, again, papal documents are not about giving us answers, but they're about giving us insights. And this particular document that I want to talk about is to me one of the most unique magisterial documents I've ever read uh, for, for several reasons. First is the tone. Again, this sounds like a very um, inarticulate and almost fuzzy word. What does tone mean? Usually, magisterial documents are written in a very precise manner because they're meant to focus on the past because they are expressions of the living tradition of the church. So they want to use what went on before. They want to gather it and, and refocus things in a new way. And they can be quite frankly, as I sometimes tell my students in class, they can be quite frankly at times quite boring, though very important, some of them. Uh, this document is quite different. It can be very folksy at times. It can be very uh, matter of fact. It can be very harsh. And at times it's almost like he wants to kick somebody in the butt and say, get going. What, let me give you a few examples. Verse 10. Consequently, an evangelizer must never look like someone who has just returned from a funeral. <laughs> there are Christians whose lives seem like Lent without Easter. We should never respond to questions that no one asks. Isn't that great? A new self-centered paganism is growing. Uh, whenever we encounter another person in love, we learn something new about God. The church has to accept the unruly freedom of the word, which accomplishes what it wills in ways that surpass our calculations. Uh, da -da. The church is not a toll house. Uh, here's one of my favorite, and this is downright rude, but funny. <laughs> We know that the faithful attach great importance, this is verse 135, great importance to the homily, and that both they and their ordained ministers suffer because of homilies. The laity from having to listen to them and the clergy from having to preach them. <laughs> but then, like the pastor he is, he spends 15 verses giving you a little explanation of how he prepares a homily. The tone of the document. Secondly, and this is, again, may seem a bit petantic, but it's, it's striking. For a document that came out of a synod on the new evangelization, for a topic, the new evangelization, around which there was so much confusion, what do you mean, what should we do? He mentions the phrase eight times. Only eight times in a document of around 60 or 70 pages. He dodges the whole issue and says in verse 11, every form of authentic evangelization is new. Thank you, Pope Francis. Um, I think thirdly, and again, this may seem a bit pedantic, but I think it's huge. Um, the starting point of this document is not the same as other documents, the two recent documents that deal with mission whether Evangelii Nunciandi in 1974 or Redemptoris Missio. Both began Jesus Christ, doctrine, centrality, boom. This document 
talks about the missionary transformation of the church, but it begins with an introduction of almost 18 verses talking about joy. It is joy that we should experience, and it's from out of joy that we should talk about Jesus Christ. This completely shifts much of the discussion about mission and evangelization from Matthew 28, go to all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit, to, well, of course I want to share with people something that I have been touched by. But there's another edge to that. Do we have joy? Have we really allowed ourselves to reflect on the greatness of God's love in our life? And maybe that's the place to start. So a new starting point. Clear influence of liberation theology. There's many different types of liberation theology. Don't be worried by the term, please. Um, but a clear influence in terms of words, in terms of what's said. Oh, where, let me get my, how am I doing here? Yeah. Um, the option for the poor is central. I think if there are three key pivots of the document, hermeneutical keys, if you will, for interpreting them, um, they would be people of God, the poor, and the Holy Spirit. And let me briefly tell you why I think each of them is central. The Second Vatican Council in the document Lumen Gentium has a variety of images for church that it provides. And that's the way council documents go. You know, you want to throw in, it's sort of like making a stew. You throw in as much as is as acceptable and then let the theologians in the church later sort it all out. Um, very early after the council, Latin American theologians in liberation theology picked up on the image of the people of God. Oops, I better get back over here. Mike's going to get mad. Uh, which was from scripture, the people of God going through the desert on a journey in history through time together. Um, this image wrangled many in the Vatican uh, because it smacked too closely of Marxist people, you know, the masses. And there was an ongoing battle that went from 1978, really, until 1985, where at a synod of bishops, it was decided the image for church was not people of God, but communio, communion, stressing what? The functioning, the solidarity, the peace, the orderliness of the church internally. And so people of God still existed but it was not really used. What is striking about this document, there's not one reference to church as communio, as people of God. And not just as a way maybe to say, neener, 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 we won, but as a way of pointing out a key facet of who we are. Who are we? We are people that have been called and people that God molds into a people. A people. Not in the sense of homogenization or uniformity, but in a, as a people. Walking through time, people who are engaged in the world. We are a people. The poor. There's 81 references to the poor. 81. And the, what is crucial is the poor are not seen as beneficiaries of charity for the most part. There are some references, you know, feed the poor, help the poor. The poor are linked to faith and the poor are seen as, as people that are very much the victims of globalization, economic injustice around the world, and of individualistic spiritualities that want us to ignore. And in verse 189, every Christian and community is called to be an instrument of God for the liberation and promotion of the poor, enabling them to be fully a part of society. 
We must listen to the cry of the poor and help. A lack of solidarity toward his or her needs will directly affect our relationship with God. Strong words from a pope who sees the poor on the one hand as being very much marginalized and some of the strongest words in the document come when he speaks about the effect of international structures on the poor. But he's also very nuanced. He lived in Argentina. So he says, I'm not just talking about welfareism. I'm talking about governments and systems that allow people to be fully integrated in society and live as human beings. I think, let's see, how am I doing here? Whoops. Okay. So I think what, on one hand, what he's calling us for is conversion. Conversion of individuals and structures. He's calling individuals, he talks about temptations of pastoral workers. Whether it's comfort, whether it's a bureaucratic mentality, whether it's too narrow a vision, whether it's ignoring the poor. He's saying, come on, get with the program. We have to get out of ourselves because the danger is that, we're, that we become narrow as individuals looking at the world and God or narrow in looking at church, that it's not about us. From radical individualism to a people, to see ourselves as a people. And he stresses that. He also makes note of, just briefly, of some of the fights in the church. He said, look it, we're not, I'm not talking about starting with doctrines. We start with joy and we start with love. And he says, sometimes in churches, it's almost a veritable witch hunt by people that are focused on laws and doctrines. And he says, stop it, stop it. He points out the need for structural reform. And again, some of the strongest words in the document. He says the papacy should not be over-centralized. He says structures of church are meant to serve evangelization, whether they're parishes or the papacy. And structures should be looked at and new questions asked. Otherwise, it can lead to a business mentality caught up in management, statistics, plans, evaluations, whose principal beneficiaries is not the God's people, but the church as an institution. My God. <laughs> sizzle, sizzle. <laughs> but linking structural reform to the task of evangelization. Not as a new program, not new workshops, but looking at what we have in a different way. And again, uh, reasserting the stress, the importance of evangelization. Not as doctrine as a starting point, evangelization is still relevant. Why? Because we want to share this joy. He notes that as Christians, we are in global systems. He talks about that. And it's not just something that's out there. It also affects us. There are temptations from secularism. At one point, he talks about uh, some peoples that work in parishes and, and, and churches as being practical atheists because they go about their daily life with no real focus or trust in the Holy Spirit. But that he says, we have a duty as Christians to be, bring justice, mercy, and love to these systems, even as he says they are opaque. It's very hard. But he says, don't get concerned with overanalysis. The phrase, uh, what, paralysis by analysis? He doesn't exactly use that phrase, but he means it. We have to be open to what the Spirit calls us. And he recognizes the different contexts we're in as Christians, whether it's culture, whether it's youth, whether it's women. He says, yes, these are, and certainly the poor, these are areas we have to look at and talk about. Another issue in terms of context and global systems that is rather phenomenal, and I'll stop in, a couple, in just a minute, um, 
If you look in the footnotes, which of course we all do, you'll find a phenomenal number of references to bishops' gatherings. Um, wanting to highlight in his own text that he has listened to bishops' conferences. So you have references from Latin American bishops, the Oceania Synod, the Asia Synod, French bishops, American bishops, the Brazilian bishops, Filipino bishops, even Congo, for gosh sakes, Middle East and Europe. He wants to give a model of how to listen and learn. Who are we to conclude? We're a people, a people who've been touched by Christ, who want to share with others and make everyone fully human. Because being a part of a people and being touched by Christ makes us less narrow. That is one of the themes in this document. It makes us narrow. It opens us up, not only to the love of God, but to other people. Joy and love, not law and obligation, is the starting point. We're people who risk, who get out from the routine in normal situations because the Holy Spirit is moving us and we're rooted in the option for the poor. We explain ourselves by the witness of our lives, by hope, not despair, by not being afraid to ask new and different types of questions. We're aware of this new world and we're neither naive nor overly pessimistic. But we recognize that with this new world come new challenges and that the church's role is primarily not material, not economic. He says we talk about economic justice, we talk about justice in the world, but primarily the church's role is to talk about the love of Christ because everyone is longing for love. Everyone. Final thoughts. Challenges exist to be overcome. Let us be realists, but without losing our joy, our boldness, our hope, filled commitment, let us allow our, not allow ourselves to be robbed of missionary vigor. And there we go. <laughs> so thank you very much for your patience and attention. Thank you. Thank you.